Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. May we please call Mr Thorpe? Yeah. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm, declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the and truth. But the truth. Thank you. Could you please confirm your full name, Mr. Thorpe? Frederick Leslie Thorpe. Thank you very much for coming to the inquiry um, to give evidence and for the provision of your witness statement. Uh, you should have that witness statement in front of you. Um, it's dated the 22nd of December 2023. Yes. And if you turn to the last page of that, which is page 14, is that your signature? It is, yes. And I understand that you have a couple of corrections you'd like to make before we proceed. Yes, the first correction is that... Um when I made the statement, I hadn't had sight, or I wrote in the statement that I hadn't had sight of Mrs. McKelvey's uh, tape transcript. I've since had sight of that, so that, if that could be altered. And the other amendments were that um, I wrote in that after the interview with Mr. McLaughlin and Mrs. McKelvey, I hadn't had no further in, involvement in the prosecution case of either Kip party, but in fact it brought to my attention that because I made a witness statement, I had in fact had some involvement. So they're the, just the two amendments that I, I feel I should make. And just for the purpose of the transcript, um, in relation to the interview tapes of Mrs McKelvey, that should be um, paragraph 39 of your witness statement at page 13. Um, you say that... I have now seen case papers relating to this case, but not the interview tape transcripts. So that's a correction in relation to that, that you have seen those transcripts. So, in fact, if you just delete the, but not the, um, and, but not the, and put in there, and yes. I've seen the case papers related to the case and the tape interview tape transcripts. Thank you. That would satisfy that one. And then just in relation to both case studies that you did provide a witness statement in both cases, but those were limited to describing the fact and the fact of both the audit and the interview, is that correct? Yes, yes. Thank you. So having made those corrections, are the contents of that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They, they are, yes. And for the purposes of the transcript, the URN is WITN 10410100. As you know, my name is Megan Miller, and I will be asking you questions on behalf of the inquiry. And I think you'd agree that you've had a long and varied career working for the post office. Yes. And, but the, for the purposes of your evidence today, I'll just be focusing on the conduct of investigations, and particularly in Northern Ireland. Okay, yep. So could we start, please, with the roles you held while working for the post office? And is it correct that your career with the post office spanned from 1976 to January 2003? It, it, it does, yes. Al, albeit the very first part, I wasn't a direct employee of the post office. I was a sub-postmaster, so I was an agent of the post office, but was working for the post office at that time, yeah. Thank you. And <clears throat> so when you started working for the, as a, a sub-postmaster, that was in 1976, is that yes. correct? And you then held a number of roles in post office branches until 1987 when you became an audit manager. Yes. And you were promoted to district audit manager in 1990 before you became a security and investigation manager in 1993, is that yes. right? Yes. And in that role, were you based in Leeds? Sorry, yeah. It, were you based in Leeds when you became a security and investigation manager? Well, I became security investigation manager following a, a, a business reorganisation. Um, the, the area I was working in, the district, Newcastle, was merged with Leeds. And um, my job as an audit manager disappeared, but I went with my finance manager into security investigation. Initially, I was doing the physical security, procedural security, and the design of um, 
security equipment for sub post offices before I was moved on to the investigation side. And so then in 1996, is it right that you were asked um, if you'd be interested in becoming an investigation manager? Yes. And so just in terms of the titles of those roles, up to that point you'd been a security and investigation manager. How did this role then, the new one in 1996, differ from that? Um, it, it differed in so much as the, as I say, the first part of the um, uh, job was security, physical security, procedural security. Um, and then the second part was purely looking at the investigative side of crime or potential crime against the post office. And you then explain in your statement at paragraph 10 that when this vacancy arose, so the investigation manager vacancy, there were there was no one who was suitably qualified to fill that vacancy as almost all of the investigators had been part of the post office investigation department, which at that point had been disbanded. Is that correct? That, that, it, what, what had happened when it was disbanded, the respective um, investigators had been moved into Royal Mail or, or post office counters. Not everybody seemed to be happy with their allotted business. Um, and one of the investigators um, put into post office counters in Leeds um, didn't like the job. Well, he liked the job, but he, he transferred to Royal Mail at the first opportunity, and there were no other suitably qualified ex POID officers available. And I was asked, would I like to do the job, subject to uh, an assessment to see whether I was had the right capabilities. So it wasn't then that the ex POID officers were unsuitable in so much as they were unqualified to fill the new vacancy, but they'd already been allocated to different roles, is that right? I, I think it was because they'd been allocated to different roles in a different business rather than the lack of qualifications. And how was your suitability for that role assessed? Well, well I had to come to London for an interview with the ex-head of Post Office Investigations um, and also there was a psychiatrist available who did a psychiatric evaluation. Um, following the interview, then um, my boss in Leeds was told they felt I was suitable, subject to being able to arrange some training. There wasn't an formal training course um, available at that time. So can I just stop you there, just to go back to the evaluation? And what did you understand the purpose of the psychiatric evaluation to be? To be quite honest, I wasn't quite sure or whether it was, I don't know, to decide whether I was too gung-ho to go charging into investigating people or I, I wasn't sure. It was just something that was thrown in when I uh, was interviewed for the job. So. And did you understand that to be common practice? Did other investigators undergo psychiatric evaluation? Well, I, I don't know anything about the the uh, recruitment process for the POID officers as they were then. So I'm not I'm not sure whether that was part of their uh, initiation or sort of in, initial interview. I'm not sure. And were you told what the results of that psychiatric evaluation was? Uh, well, I assume it was okay because I got the job, but uh, I didn't get a formal feedback from it. No. So is it right then you, were, you believe you were the first person to be recruited uh, since the post office investigation department was disbanded as I, an I, investigator? I believe at that time I, I was, um, but that, that's my belief. I may, I may be wrong because obviously the, the post office spread over throughout the, the UK, but I believe I was the first one to go through it. And so in 1996, what geographical areas were you responsible for? 1996, it was, um, well, I was based... Um, on Leeds, but my area was the northeast from the Hull up to the Scottish borders um, and bordered in by the Pennines. So, so the, the, the very northeast uh, section of, um, of England. And then is it right that following the retirement of two officers in Scotland and Northern Ireland in 2000 that you also became responsible for those regions? Well, well, my boss at that time said, you're, you're the nearest. Would you like to?
to do the job. Um, and they, yeah, they, well, that, that was basically it. And I said, OK. So I shadowed the outgoing um, POID officer in Scotland. And um, Do you remember who that was? It was a man called Peter Webb. He, he'd formerly been a senior manager within POID. And did you also mentor someone, the person who had been responsible for Northern Ireland? I, I don't know. I never met them. I, I don't know uh, who, who they were. So. And do you know why those individuals weren't replaced? So why another um, person wasn't sent to Scotland and another person wasn't sent to Northern Ireland, rather than you being asked to take over those roles? Well, I was doing the investigation role in the northeast of England. I don't know what... Um, efforts were made to find somebody um, else to do the, that area, I don't know. Geographically, I was the nearest person to take it over. So is it right then from 2000 until your retirement in 2003 that you managed a team of four investigator, uh, investigators who were based in Newcastle, uh, Glasgow, Perth and Belfast? Yes. And were you still based in the northeast of England throughout that time? I, well, I didn't actually have an office as such, um, so I used to divide my time between Newcastle and Glasgow, spending more time probably in Glasgow than I did um, in, in Newcastle. And were you ever based in Belfast throughout that time? No, no. I, well, traditionally, going back... POID days, there was only ever one officer in Belfast. Um, and so what would happen, um, the investigator was Suzanne Winter, and I would fly over <laughs> probably once a month, more often if there was a need for it, which it sometimes there was. But um, So Glasgow was a good base um, for me. And so, as you said, the manager in Belfast was Suzanne Winter, who the inquiry heard from last Friday. That's right? Yes, yes, I believe so. And then the manager based in Perth was Raymond Grant, who the inquiry also heard from last week. Was it Raymond Grant who you Ra managed? Raymond Grant was the officer in Perth, yes. So then was part of your role supervising the day-to-day -day conduct of investigations in Northern Ireland? Well, Su Suzanne would do that. Basically, we were a small team, and although I had the title team leader, um, there was enough work to keep everybody active, including myself. So rather than being sort of sitting in a desk managing, I was sort of active as well. So all activities in Northern Ireland were conducted by uh, Suzanne Winter. Um, in Scotland, it depended. There, there, there wasn't a geographical split. So Shirley, Shirley Stockdale or Raymond Grant would pick up the work where, wherever it was within Scotland and in the northeast of England, the officer there, um, I would support him if necessary or if I was unavailable, then somebody from the northeast team would, um, based in Leeds <coughs> excuse me, um, would go and support him. So did you have any supervisory function in Northern Ireland with Miss Winter's investigations? Well, well, I was her supervisor as such, so um, any work that she undertook, we would discuss as, uh, as a team rather than leaving her out there on a limb. Yeah. <coughs> And before 2000, when you took responsibility for Northern Ireland, did you have any experience of conducting investigations there yourself? No, no, not in Northern Ireland or Scotland, no. <coughs> when, when you took on the role, um, did you appreciate the differences in how the legal systems and processes worked in Northern Ireland and Scotland? Not, not until I moved there, no. Um, I did speak to... <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, post Office Legal Services for advice, but the advice was they don't know. They did well, that they, they weren't fully up to speed on Irish and Scottish law to be able to advise. <coughs> so it became quite a steep learning curve. Take your time. 
for yeah. Susanna myself to learn how to um, process cases to the prosecution. So partly because um, previously we've been able to deal directly with the DPP, direct, direct of public prosecutions. So we're going to we'll come on to that. But just <coughs> back to your point about whenever you first took on the role, you didn't really have experience in Northern Ireland, no. and you sought advice from Post Office Legal Services. Yeah. Do you remember who that was in Post Office Legal Services? Well, I had a lot of dealings with Rob Wilson, but I, I can't say for certain that it was Rob Wilson that actually get, said we can't help. Um, okay. But, but I sort of remember him from my days in England. So moving then um, to the training that you received, first when you became an investigator and then throughout your time in the role, um, in your statement at paragraph 11, you explained that when you first became an investigator in 1993, there was no formal training available, and you touched on that earlier. Yeah. And is it right then that your initial training was provided by the Security and Investigation Service in Croydon? It, it was, yes, the training team in Croydon, yes. And was that team an external team or an internal team? No, it was an internal team. And to the best of your recollection, who provided that training? Was it investigators or lawyers or a mixture? It, well, several of them I know were ex-POID officers who, who changed to a training role, uh, but whether everybody was, I'm not sure. <clears throat> and how long did that initial course last? Well, it wasn't like a formal course of sort of three weeks or four weeks. It was a case of I would go down to Croydon and this week we would do um, interview techniques, investigation techniques or whatever, and then um, another week I'd go down and it may just be going round courts to see how the court system operated and things like that. So it was very much made up on, on, on the, as it went along, it was made up until eventually they felt I had sufficient knowledge and then I went back to Leeds with a POID officer who was then going to be my shadow and uh, mentor for any work that I did. At the end of the course to assess, was there any assessment to see whether you had uh, reached the sufficient knowledge to um, proceed? There was no formal assessment as such, no. And who was the ex-POID officer then that mentored you when you went back up to Leeds? I can't remember. It was a lady, but I can't remember her name. She was based in Croydon. Um, she travelled up from Croydon um, to Leeds on a weekly basis to mentor me. But I, I, I can't. No, I can't remember her name. Sorry, it was 20 odd, 25 years ago. <laughs> And so your initial training um, predated the Criminal Procedure and Investigation Act, which came into force in 1996. Um, do you remember receiving any specific training on disclosure after that legislation came into force? No, I, do, I don't, no. <clears throat> do you remember at any point receiving training on disclosure? We had... After my training was complete, um, we had regular security investigation team meetings um, where most points of law and um, changes to the law were discussed. And those, they, were, they were held probably every, uh, probably every couple of months. Um, but I, I can't be, you know, be specific as to how often it was about that. And who would have communicated the changes in the law to you in those team meetings? Yes, yes. Who would that have been? Sorry. 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 So who, who would the person have been in those team meetings that would have explained to you as an investigator this piece of law has now changed? Um, most of the, the training was headed by um, people from security investigations in Croydon and Phil Gerrish was often active in that, in the role of um, leading the, the meetings. 
And you then also explain in your statement that team members would also attend periodic training arranged by the Central Security and Investigation Team, is that right? That's right, yes. Did you attend that training or was it members of your team? No, usually, uh, usually the whole team would, would attend. <clears throat> and who delivered that training? Again, it would probably be somebody from the um, National Security or an investigation team, one of the trainers. They had a, as far as I understand, they had a group of trainers who would come out and give that, or it may just be um, Phil Gerrish or one of the managers responsible for the particular topic we're talking about. And in relation to that periodic training, in your statement you say that the topics covered included audit and it says investigator but I think that should probably be investigation so audit and investigation with horizon afterwards in brackets you put well that was I think it was just a one day familiarisation um, session where they said this is horizon this is what it can do these are the reports you can get from it but that was it, there was no real hands on working on it, um, which in hindsight was probably a failing, but, uh, but, but that's all it was, just a one day, this is what's coming in to replace the old pen and paper system. And do you remember when that was? Was that around the time of the rollout of Horizon? It, it must have been around about the time of the rollout, so I would say, what, about 1998, 1999, but I can't be sure of the date. And can you remember who, in particular, led that um, one-day session? No, I, 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 I can't think who, who delivered the session, no. So during that one-day session, um, did you receive training on how to analyse the data from the Horizon system? I, I don't think the session lasted that long. It was more a case of this is the, the kit that they're going to be using in the post offices. Um, you can get your information off it, um, or you can go back to Horizon and ask for information. But it was, it was a very, very basic, as best that I remember. And did any of your training or the periodic training cover the conduct of investigations or prosecutions in Northern Ireland? It, it didn't. No, because, as I say, the, the two experts were Suzanne Winder and myself, and we didn't know a great deal at that time. And um, is it right, then, that you um, mentored Miss Winter whenever she started conducting investigations in Northern Ireland? Well, we worked, we worked together. Um, I think the first investigation we did, I led the actual investigation. We submitted the, we were told that we couldn't submit the papers directly to DPP as we were now a, a limited company. We had no more clout than Marks and Spencer or one of the big chains. So we had to go through the PSNI. And the first case that I remember doing, we submitted the papers to the police in Londonderry and uh, we got a response back, that's rubbish, there's nothing I can do with those, and that was it. So then we had to sort of rethink what the problem was, um, because the detective sergeant who'd reviewed the cases didn't seem interested in meeting up with us, so we made um, arrangements to speak to the police in Belfast and to try and work out a, a system whereby we could report, as, uh, as, as the first line of reporting was going to be the police, how we would report to the police. And just, um, just before we get into a bit more detail on that process that you developed, um, so you explain at paragraph 23 of your statement that investigations followed the rules set out in the PNCE order, Northern Ireland, 1989. Is that the police and criminal evidence order? Yes, the police and criminal evidence order, no, yeah, of Northern Ireland, yes. So does it follow from your earlier answers that you you weren't really um, you didn't remember any specific internal policies or guidance uh, for Northern Ireland? Not that I can remember, no. And 
so you, there was nothing for you to access in terms of guidance. Um, it was for you and Miss Winter to decide how to conduct the investigation. Unfortunately, it was because by the time we were getting to the point of submitting cases, um, Mr. Webb, who had been the senior investigator in Scotland, Northern Ireland, had left the business, and there was really nobody to actually talk with within the post office. We spoke to legal services. They <coughs> said that they couldn't offer us any specific advice, so um, we contacted the police. Um, I said, we, initially I was involved, and then Suzanne Winter took it on, and she in fact <laughs> developed the process for submitting files to the police service so that uh, they could be assessed and considered for for action or non-action. And so the, the catalyst for that was really whenever you and Suzanne Winter submitted your first case, the feedback from the PSNI was the quality of that's not good enough. And you then went away to develop a process that you could put in place. Well, well it did the uh, process because it, Ultimately, <clears throat> the files that we were producing were very similar to the files we produced in that first instance. Um, as I say, the, the, the police sergeant who reviewed the case wasn't willing to meet and critique and say, well, you know, that was rubbish because. So um, we took it on ourselves to speak to the police service, see what they suggested, what we, where we had failed, and what, how we could improve, and how they wanted everything reporting to them. And so do you remember who, from the police side, um, assisted you in developing that process? I, I can't. Suzanne Winter would have been the one, because, as I say, initially I was involved, then because of my location in Glasgow, it was easy for Suzanne to, to liaise with the police on a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month basis. And do you remember when it was, roughly, in terms of the year that that process then was developed? I think it must have been probably around about 2000. Um, it was fairly early on in, the, um, in my involvement in Northern Ireland. And so the inquiry hasn't been able to find um, a written process dated from around that time specific to Northern Ireland. Do you remember if that process was committed to writing by Miss Winter? I can't, I can't remember whether it was or not. Um, Can you describe briefly what the process that you developed or Miss Winter led in developing involved? Well, well, pretty much the same as we, we had been doing in, in England. It was pre preparing a prosecution file, which included the sort of offender report, the um, tape um, transcriptions, um, list of evidence, list of the um, unused material, and uh, a disclosure listing as well. So. So just want to take um, one step back to back to the audit process and before going into the investigation process in a little bit more detail. Um, could we please have page six of Mr Thorpe's witness statement on screen? Um, it's WITN 1041010. <coughs> And page six, please. And on to paragraph 19. So you explain at paragraph 19 um, that where the pattern of irregularities suggested deliberate action rather than error, then the district audit manager would be contacted and a special audit of the accounts of the post office under suspicion requested. Um, so is this a description of what would happen um, before a special audit? Well, it, it depends. 
one of the most common um, problem, well, problem, problems we had was with pension allowances. Um, and what would happen is that they paid order unit, Lisa Halley, up in London Derry, would take an, an office, check all the pension allowances. If they found any discrepancies, they would report that back to us after a, after a period of time. We would then um, intercept the pouches from the office locally, have them checked locally, and a schedule would be, would be produced from the results of the checks. When it was decided that the evidence was such that it was probably deliberate action rather than error, then we would ask for a special order to be committed. Uh, 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 um, and then we would attend the office on the day of the, of the audit. And who then decided that the evidence was such that it suggested that um, there was deliberate action as opposed to error? Uh, well, ultimately, it would have been myself. And so in what circumstances would you consider um, the evidence would suggest that there was deliberate action rather than just error on the part of a sub-postmaster or postmistress? Well, well, with the regularity of the pension overclip, you see, we're going back sort of almost pre-horizon when people still had paid or, uh, pension books and you had to tear a foil out so postmaster retained the foil and paid the 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 the, 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 the person the appropriate amount um, and these pension allowance foils were accumulated in the office ad listed and the figure put into the cash account now if there were once they started being checked if they were regularly missing then you would check the office account and if there wasn't a corresponding surplus, the question is why? And sometimes there were large amounts, sometimes there were only small amounts, which would possibly be a keying error. Um, and once we'd established that, we would then call an audit. If, after doing the checks, um, there wasn't a, a pattern developing, then we would perhaps pass it back to the retail network manager as a training issue or maybe just to speak to the sub-postmaster and say it. And so a few lines down then on par at paragraph 19, um, you explain that on initial entry at the office, uh, the investigation manager would introduce themselves and explain why the audit had been arranged. Did, did you or your or Miss Winter um, attend a special audit as a matter of course? Yes, <coughs> special audits we would, yes. And um, you also explained that the investigator would explain that following the audit, the sub-postmaster or staff from a directly managed branch office would be invited to attend a formal interview under caution. Yes. Were they invited to that interview before the audit had actually taken place? Yes, we would have done. Um, the reason being that we had a a potential problem which the schedule demonstrated and so we would need to speak to the sub postmaster in the first instance because we didn't know how they ran their office did they run it hands-on did they run it from a distance you know were staff involved so we, we weren't at that level we, we weren't sure um, who would be involved so we would speak to the sub postmaster in the first instance we would explain that we would be uh, conducting the interview under caution and we further explain their legal rights and that if they wanted to make arrangements to have a solicitor present or make arrangements to, have a, to interview in the solicitor's office or whatever, um, they could do that once the audit was completed. Uh, and we also um, uh, mention the, the friend option and say if you want to invite Often it was a union representative for branch office staff or federation of sub-postmasters for sub-postmasters. Um, but we were fairly lenient on who we allowed as a friend just in the um, 
just so as not to overwhelm the, the person being interviewed. Was it ever the case, though, that a special audit revealed that there was actually no problem with the branch and that the accounts were, had been balanced? It, 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 it could do. It, it, um, I can't think of a particular instance where it did. Um, it could do, in which case we say, OK, there's no problem here, it's just a careless sub-postmaster. And then we speak to the retail network manager and arrange to have error notices issued to um, collect the money's due or repay the money's due from the um, overstating of the pension allowance that we'd found. And in those situations, then, a formal interview under caution wouldn't be necessary, is that right? We, we probably would still do that. Um, maybe seem a bit heavy-handed, but as I say, until we spoke to the sub-postmaster, we didn't know exactly how the office was managed and uh, how many staff they had, was the one-man band, as I say, whether he managed the office from afar or what. So does it follow from that but, b that before a special audit had taken place, it had already been decided that a criminal investigation of some description would follow the audit? Yes, we would speak with the retail network manager explain what, we, what evidence we had and we would then report back to the retail network manager following the audit and it could be, say, look, it's not the sub-postmaster, there's no evidence to show that he's involved in this in any way, in which case the retail network manager would take, there's no action to take other than arrange for the um, uh, error notices to be raised or it could point to the member of staff, in which case you know, they would need to be interviewed as well. So that deals then with special audits. Um, could you just explain briefly what the difference between a special audit and a scheduled audit is? Well, a special audit the, would be arranged for a Thursday morning. Each branch had to prepare a weekly account. It did then, I think it's changed since. But they had to prepare a weekly account um, on a Wednesday. So going on a Thursday, you should be faced with a signed cash account representing all the cash of stock which should be in the office at that time. And there should no, be no further business transacted between that being prepared and the audit taking place. So it was a, <clears throat> a checking exercise. There was no sort of room for error. That should be what's there. If it isn't there, why not? And uh, a standard audit was would be when the auditors went in any day of the week and completed an audit of the office on that on that day. And there was no particular reason for that audit in terms of an error hadn't been flagged necessarily, in terms of a scheduled audit. A specialist audit wouldn't be called unless there was mm -hmm. grounds for an, an investigation. No, um, we would do that to try and establish the facts of what was happening. And a scheduled audit was just done at certain periods in time just to check in on a well, branch? Well, the, the, the district audit manager would draw up an audit programme and auditors would go out so that every office was audited over a period. Um, so the auditors would just go out and do an audit on a, any day of the week, really. So if we could go over the page then to paragraph 20 of your witness statement, please. And you explain that there, that where accounting discrepancies uh, were identified during a scheduled audit, the first point of contact by the auditors would usually be the respective retail network manager. And when you say usually there, would there be exceptions to that? S -s Sorry, I missed the last part of that. So you say that the first point of contact would usually be the retail manager. Yep. Were there exceptions when it wasn't the retail manager? No, no. Um, <clears throat> the retail network managers were responsible for their outlets. So if the, um, the audit found a discrepancy, they would speak to the retail network manager who had the option of just dealing with it himself, so recovering the monies or whether it was um, operational errors or whatever. Uh, and if the retail network manager found, felt there was more to it, then he would speak to ourselves and we would 
then assess the facts and then invite the sub-postmaster again. It's the first point of contact because they were the ones who um, ran the operation. So um, your investigation team wouldn't be present at a scheduled audit, is that right? At a scheduled audit, no, no. So is it uh, the decision of the retail network, network manager alone to decide whether to involve your team? Basically, yes, yeah. Um, but if they decided to deal with it as a disciplinary matter, you wouldn't become involved or know about it necessarily at all? There'd be no need to involve ourselves, no. And that statement can come down, please. Thanks. <coughs> and was that the case throughout the time you were involved in conducting criminal investigations, that the retail network manager would make the decision as to whether an investigation was necessary? Well, they, they had that right because the, the outlet was, was managed by the retail line. And obviously, if they made a decision which was wrong then they will be held to account. So it was you know, up, up to them to decide on the, on the facts what they were, how they wanted to treat the, the matter. And when you say they would be held to account if they made the wrong decision, who would they be held to account by? Well, the, the, well each district had a head of retail network and all these retail network managers reported to the head of retail network. Um, but obviously their actions had to be explain to the head if, uh, if, if they were wrong. So did you have a view at the time on whether it was appropriate for the retail network managers um, to decide if a criminal investigation was appropriate? Not, not really. Um, they managed the outlets, so if they decided they would deal with it, that, that was fine. I had no strong feelings that we should be always involved as investigators. Then focusing on what happened following an audit in Northern Ireland, it's correct then that once your team became involved, um, the case would be allocated to Miss Winter, is that correct? Yes, yes. And you explained in your statement that as you were a small team, you've already said, um, you were actively involved in interviews, is that correct? That's right, yes. And sometimes you were the lead investigator and sometimes you were second officer? Yes. <clears throat> You go on to explain that the circumstances and location of the case would dictate your role. Can you just explain what you mean by that? Um, well, sometimes it would be workload. If the investigator for the area, in say Miss Winter in Northern Ireland, had a couple of active cases she was working on, then I would take the lead and then I could do the necessary uh, write-ups and... Um, preparation of prosecution files if necessary to relieve the workload from her. So in Northern Ireland, you were both lead investigator and second officer on different cases, is that right? Uh, yes, yeah, I could do either role, yeah. Um, <coughs> and in your statement, you describe Miss Winter as a highly trained and experienced investigator. Yep. What was your understanding of her training and experience? To be quite honest, I, I don't think I ever went into what her training had been. My observations were just working with her, seeing the quality of her work, and you know, I had every confidence that what she was doing was, was good, so I, I was quite happy with that. But what training she'd received, I may have known, but I, I honestly can't remember. So going back to the interview process then, um, is it correct that up until 2001, interviews in Northern Ireland were recorded in writing by your team? No, it's an interview, that's right, yes. And then it was only after 2001 that they were recorded on tape? Sometime, and I can't remember where I saw the authority to do that, but, but, but yes, we were allowed to do that. And you estimate that you personally conducted in excess of 100 interviews? Well, I was trying to work it out, and, and I, I think probably round about the 100 mark, including all my interviews in England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, yeah. And following the interview then, um, 
would it be the case that the investigation manager would conduct further inquiries to follow up on the account given in interview? It, it, well, yes, it's possible. As I said, our first point of contact would be the sub-postmaster. Now, whatever came from that could lead out to further investigations, yes. <coughs> and were you involved in liaising with Miss Winter in respect of what further inquiries were necessary in a particular case? <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Sorry, could you repeat that? No problem. Uh, were you involved in liaising with Miss Winter in respect of what further inquiries might be necessary in a particular case? Yes, yeah, we, we would discuss cases on a regular basis. And you explain in your statement that the investigation <coughs> manager would liaise with other departments where necessary to request further information. Yes. And you explain that the most common departments were the post office audit department, yeah. um, the Department for Work and Pensions, yeah. and National Savings and Gyro Bank. Is that correct? That's, that's right, yeah. You also explained that at the time of your involvement, it was not common practice to practice, beg your pardon, to contact Horizon. No, um, with my involvement, it was, uh, Horizon was in its infancy. <clears throat> we were still operating the paper-based system, Horizon, and even a different system in the branch post offices. And we'd never been given um, any direct contacts with Horizon. And... Um, when you say Horizon, do you mean Fujitsu? Sorry, Fujitsu, yeah, Fujitsu. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So if, um, would you have been aware of how you could have contacted Fujitsu if you'd wanted to? I, I don't think I was aware at that time. Um, if we needed to, we'd have had to probably go through national security. Were you aware of the availability of the different types of data from Fujitsu, such as the ARQ data? I, I think at that time, we would be more reliant on audit because they had the hands-on experience of dealing with Horizon. Um, and we'd say, you know, we're looking at pension allowances, can you run off some reports and get them to run off the reports, which we could then use and check any evidence or information that we had. Um, ultimately, the investigators did develop a skill of uh, interrogating the system and getting reports from, from, from Fujitsu. But in the early days, it was still in its infancy and it was a little bit vague as to what we could get and when we could get it. So were, at some point, did you then start to request reports from Fujitsu? which was data from the system? Personally, I've never requested any, I never requested anything from, from Fujitsu. And up until my leaving, I don't believe anybody on the team, whether in Scotland or Northern Ireland, would re request information. And then could we please have um, Mr Thorpe's witness statement back on screen at page seven? <laughs> And while we're waiting for that to come up, so was it your role then that, um, to review the file and then decide whether a case should be submitted for prosecution advice? Yes, yes. And about halfway through this paragraph, paragraph 20, um, you explain, so you explain that, that uh, as team leader, you would decide whether to submit the case for prosecution advice. And then you've written, comma, England, comma, post office legal services, if prosecution would, was advised, I would discuss it with my line manager. Do you mean there that before you submitted a case for prosecution advice, you would discuss it with your line manager in England? Usually, yes, yes. Um. And then you go on to say, in Scotland and Northern Ireland, cases were referred to the procurator fiscal who would decide on what action to take without further consultation with post office limited managers. Should you also have included the Procurator Fiscal or the DPP it, in Northern Ireland? Yes, Africa? sorry, I missed that. Yeah. That's fine. Um, yes. 
my, my line manager appreciated that we, unlike in England where the um, legal services team would su suggest charges um, if necessary, in Scotland and Northern Ireland we had no control over what the prosecution advice would be, whether it was to reject the case, whether it was to prosecute, and so it was agreed that we would just, once the case was completed, we would discuss it with the line manager and then he would sort of give the nod, okay, push it through to the appropriate authorities to see what their view is on the case. So is it the case that before, when you're reviewing the file before you've submitted it, oh, yeah. in England you did speak to your line manager, but in Northern Ireland and Scotland you didn't? Well, well we, we, we would, in so much as given the bare bones of the, of the case, what the issue was, what we found out as part of the investigation, and then we could submit it through to the the Procurator Fiscal or the PSNI. Um, in England, we would do the same the same discussion, but then send it down to uh, Post Office Legal Services, and once it came back with a decision, we would then discuss that with the line manager uh, before um, applying for summonses and the like to uh, progress the case further, if that was the issue. So is it so? It's correct, is it that in Northern Ireland and Scotland the file didn't go off to legal services? No, no, it didn't go to legal services. No. And did you understand what the reason for that was? Was it just because the post office had no decision making power in relation to whether to prosecute? Pretty, well, I think it was historical. When I took over, that was the process. It went straight to the um, the deciding authority and uh, our legal services were not involved and whenever we spoke for advice they always said well we're not really 100% sure on Scottish and Irish law to, uh, to give advice on that so it was, they were missed out of the, the chain of uh, events. So we can, that statement can come down, thank you very much. So in respect of the Northern Irish cases you were responsible for reviewing them to decide whether they should be submitted to PSNI? Yes, yes. And that would involve cases where you'd been second officer or the lead investigator? Yeah. So, in fact, in effect, you would be reviewing cases you'd already worked on? It, 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 it's possible, yes, yes. And at that point, when you were considering whether to submit a case, um, what um, test did you apply? Before you submitted it, or what factors did you consider? Well, obviously the the evidence, the evidential trail, any admissions or denials made by the the people who've been interviewed, um, the completeness of the case, <coughs> um, <coughs> oh, excuse me, so just an overall sort of picture of, is this a, a viable case to submit? And at that point, did you ever decide that the case shouldn't be committed, submitted for a prosecution advice? It, it, it's possible. There are times when cases have been um, investigated and... Sorry, excuse me, I've got a dry throat. No, no problem. Um, it's been a case where... Um, cases have been investigated and the outcome hasn't been sufficiently serious to warrant a prosecution and that's when it would have been passed back to the retail line for them to make a decision as to how to handle it, whether it be discipline or just issue the error notices, recover the money and just business as usual. And do you remember <coughs> doing that in some of the cases you reviewed? You decided, no, actually, we're not going to submit this. We're going to hand it back to yes, the Yes, yes, that, that has happened, yes. And so you've explained before, but just to make it clear, um, when you initially became involved in investigations in Northern Ireland, files could be submitted directly from your team to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Is that correct? That, that, that was my understanding. And then... We 
following a change in 2001, um, cases had to be submitted to the police service of Northern Ireland. That's right, because we, we as, as the post office, we were sort of a, a corporate body which had the authority to go straight to the DPP. Once we became Post Office Limited, we then became a limited company, albeit solely owned by the government, but the status changed, so we then had to go the roundabout route through the police, through the PPS, and then to the DPP, yeah. <clears throat> and so what would that file initially submitted to the PSNI contain? That would contain everything. That would contain everything that your team had? Everything that we had, yes, yeah. It would be a complete file, the offender report, the tape transcripts, um, the disclosure material, witness statements, evidence, everything Everything would be there for them to make a, 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 a judgment on the merits of the case. And um, do you also explain that PS and I would assess the evidence and consider whether the case had merit. That's how you've described it, is that correct? Yeah. And what was your understanding of the test being applied by the PS and I to decide whether a case had merit? Well, whether whether they felt there was dishonesty involved in, in, in the case. Often um, they would li li liaise with Suzanne Winter because they, the cases were slightly unusual in, in the fact that they involved post office accounting procedures. So sometimes they needed a bit of clarity, clarification, guiding them through how the process worked and showing them what evidence there was to show why we believed that um, the, a, an offence had taken place. And <clears throat> once the case had been submitted to the PSNI, who did you understand was in charge of the investigation at that point? Then it would be the PSNI would be involved, in, they would be in charge of the case. They'd had all the evidence, they had the, the prosecution, for, or the, sorry, the, the, the file of evidence, and it would be them. They, they would then take it through their system to whatever level they required to decide, yeah, we can prosecute this case or send it back. It, it has no merit. So it was a PSNI investigation um, with the assistance of Miss Winter from Post Office? Basically, yes, yeah. Um, so in your statement and in your evidence, you've referred to the prosecution file then being submitted by the PSNI to the Public Prosecution Service, which is also referred to as that, the PPS. Um, it's the inquiry's understanding that from 2000 to 2003, the majority of cases in Northern Ireland would have been prosecuted still by the DPP, and um, the PPS having only been established in 2005. Does that accord with your understanding, that it would have been the DPP? Uh, that the that file sounds like an error on my behalf. So, um, <clears throat> so, so should we understand the references in your statement to PPS to be to the I, DPP? I, I think that could have been it. That's, yeah, I understand that, but that was after my time with the post office, so yeah, that's an, an error on my behalf, yeah. And... So is it the case then that even after it had been submitted by the PSNI to the DPP that Miss Winter would still be involved in, in, in assisting? Yeah, yes, she, she, to my understanding, was involved through, throughout the process um, to advise and assist, provide additional information in, um, to, to the DPP or the PSNI to progress the case, yeah. And were you also involved in helping to progress the case? Not directly. Um, I, I would be if... Miss Winter and I would, would, would discuss the case and see what was required, what she'd been asked to produce, could she produce it, and she would normally progress the case through without my involvement, without my direct involvement. Do you remember the PSNI or the DPP ever requesting that further reasonable lines of inquiry were pursued by post office? I can't remember such a case, no. And once the case had then been um, submitted to the DPP, um, whose decision was it whether to prosecute a case in Northern Ireland? If the DPP said there's grounds for prosecution, 
the business um, would accept it. You know, I would say, well, okay, go ahead for, with it. I would discuss it with my line manager and explain what was happening. Um, and that would usually go forward. The, the, the problem is that the length of time it took. In England, it was a fairly quick process because we had direct access to the legal advice. In Northern Ireland, it took a while. So did you have any input into the decision whether the DPP was going to prosecute a case or not? No, no, I wouldn't. And what would happen if the DPP decided not to prosecute a case? Then, <coughs> me, then we, would bring the, we would recover the case and discuss that with my boss and with the retail line manager because ultimately it would be his responsibility to decide what he wanted to happen with the, the case, whether he still wanted to deal with it as a discipline matter or whether he just wanted to say, well, recover the monies and reinstate the sub postmaster or, or whatever. And who um, did you report to at the time from 2000 to 2003? Um, well, my initial boss was um, a Duncan McFadgen who wasn't an investigator um, or had no investigation background. And if I was stuck with a problem with investigation, I would go to national security, national security investigations for advice from them. So he was your line manager, but had no experience of investigations, is that correct? That's, that's right, yeah. And what was his title, his job title? I've been racking my brain for weeks on that, and I can't remember. Don't worry. Um, but he was in charge of the physical security side and the investigation side. Um, and he, his area covered northwest England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and a little bit of northeast England. But he had no investigative um, background um, in, in, in the job. So... So I just want to go back to summarise the people that were involved at the various stages because it's, it'll be useful whenever we come in to look at the case studies. So um, in respect of cases in Northern Ireland after 2001, if um, there was a shortfall discovered following a special audit, the case would have gone to Miss Winter in the first instance. Yeah. Um, then you would have decided whether to submit the case to the PSNI. Uh, you said a special audit. Yes. A special audit would be something we'd arranged. Miss Winter, if it was a cash shortage, then a scheduled audit. Yep. Then that possibly would have been reported to Miss Winter. Is that what, or I misunderstood what you were asking? Sorry. So was it? So if there was a following a special audit, special audit. the case would have sat with Miss Winter. <sighs> yeah. And then you would have submitted it to the PSNI. F for following. Following our investigations. Yes. And any follow-up investigations, yes, we would have done, yes. PS and I would have reviewed the case and would have then submitted it on to the DPP if they considered it had merit. Yes. And the DPP would review the case and then would decide to prosecute if appropriate, is that right? Yeah. So then, in contrast to, with a scheduled audit, at the very start you would have also had the retail network manager who would have decided whether there was going to be a criminal investigation at the start, is that right? They, they had that option, I was going to say authority, but probably more of an option to decide whether or not, um, it would depend on the history of the office, you know, offices were audited not overly frequently, but frequently, and if the previous audit report and the current audit report showed there is an issue at the office. The, the retail line may decide it's a disciplinary issue, a training issue. We will we will deal with it and recover the monies ourselves. So, so do you agree then that the case potentially passed through quite a few hands before the decision to prosecute was made in Northern Irish cases? Not, not every case. Some cases um, where we did the special audits Again, keep going back to pension allowance fraud, but that was because it's probably the most common one that we dealt with. Um, it would be discussed with the retail line before we went in for a special audit, and then they would be told of the outcome. And based on the outcome, um, they could say, well, it was a sub-office assistant rather than a sub-postmaster. It's business as usual. 
but the sub postmaster is ultimately responsible for the shortfall. And at the time, what was your view of how effective the investigation process in Northern Ireland was? As effective as anywhere else. Um, so you considered it? Was just, it sorry. No, it, it, as effective as, as in England or Scotland, except the, the time scale was, was a bit of an issue. Um, but other than that, I think it was just as, just as effective as anywhere else. So in your experience, how long would it take from the interview to the decision to prosecute being made by the DPP in Northern Ireland, just as an estimate? Well, we're looking at probably four years, three, four years. And how did that compare with um, prosecutions in England or Wales? Well, England or Wales, it was case we do the, do the investigation, um, submit the file to the legal services, they would come back and say, yes, the case to answer, these are the specimen charges. Then we you would have an officer available to go to a local magistrate's court, swear out the, the um, summonses, and we would serve the summonses. So it was a fairly compact... And how process. long would you estimate that would take in England or Wales? Well, it would probably be done within five or six weeks in some cases. Some other cases may, may drag out a bit longer, but um, it was a fairly compact, self-contained system. Sir, so that would be an appropriate moment in my questions um, for a break, if that's a convenient moment for you. Yes, certainly. Um, so 15 minutes from now takes us to where? Just after 20 past. Fine. Well, let's give ourselves uh, an extra minute or two and say 25 past 11, all right? Thank you very much, sir. Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, Mr Thorpe, before I move on then to discuss the two case studies, um, the case of Alan McLaughlin and the case of Maureen McKelvey, I want to just ask you some questions about your knowledge or involvement with the Horizon system. Um, so in your statement, you say, in the limited time that I was involved with the Horizon, I had no knowledge of any problems with the accuracy of the Horizon system. Does that remain your position? Yes, yeah, it ha hasn't changed. Um, as I say, I, I left the post office at the beginning of 2003, and in that period between its rollout, it was still a very limited number of offices had Horizon, and I wasn't aware, and nobody said, we have a potential problem um, with, with, with the system. Could we please have the document reference WITN 0597-0134 on, on screen, please? So we can see that this document has as its title um, Review of the Horizon Cash Account System Stage 2. And just in the box below the introduction, um, it says the original TOR, which um, the inquiry understands as terms of reference, uh, had as its objective to confirm that the end-to-end -end reconciliation and accounting processes are free from system inaccuracies or discrepancies. And we can see that the first paragraph above that box, the terms of reference were agreed with the Horizon Programme Director on the 15th of July, 1999. And um, did you recognise this document from before you were provided um, by the inquiry? No, I, I, I can't remember seeing it at all, no. And the inquiry understands this document to have been written by Jeremy Folkes. Do you remember him? Jeremy? Folkes, F-O-L-K-E-S. No, I don't, I don't recognise the name. Um, so if we just go down the page a little bit under management summary, it says um, POSIS, the Post Office Security and Investigation Service, Investigations at Outlets. Um, we can see it says, we were extremely concerned to be informed during the review that POSIS currently do not have access to archived data from the system. 
data on the system is compressed and archived after 35 days. It was originally intended that access would be gained via the fraud risk management server, which formed part of the benefits payment system and has now been withdrawn. This means the business could be in a position where it's unable to investigate potential frauds or prosecute cases due to the unavailability of critical data. And then just going on to the second line, the end of the second line in the paragraph below, Les Thorpe, investigation manager in the North East region. Is, do you understand that to be a reference to you? Yes, yes. Advised <clears throat> us that Pathway had estimated the cost to reintroduce the fraud risk management server to be in the region of £180,000 with an additional fee of £1,500 per man day for performing extraction. And these concerns were highlighted after a possible fraud at Grange Park, SPSO, which is involved in the Horizon Live trial. Can you remember this advice that you've given or being involved in this review? I, I can't remember this document at all. And oh, I agree, that, that that's my name. And it's in, um, investigated in the northeast region, so I assume it must have been 1999, 1998, so when in those that period that it was written, um, but I, I just can't remember it at all, or what um, inquiries I made to find out the cost of uh, reintroducing the, the, uh, the server, or what fees would be involved thereafter. I can't remember. Do you remember having any involvement um, during the time of the live trial in feeding into um, the audit trail or anything to do with investigations? I, 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 I honestly can't. I, I, I saw this document in the, in the bundle that I was sent and uh, it gave me a shock when I saw my name. But I, I, I can't remember anything about it at all or in any involvement with Horizon, um, the Horizon Live trial. So if we could just go um, down then to the bottom of page three of that document, it's under the heading Transaction Processing. So it says under that title, during the course of the review, we were made aware of concerns that transaction processing had regarding the level of errors generated by Horizon outlets and the impact on operations with the rollout to further outlets. Mm. This is because the level of class and pivot errors are well above the expected levels of 195 and 110 per week, respectively. So do you have any, any awareness of these errors? No, none, none whatsoever, no. And then finally, if we just look at page five, the conclusion of that document. Um, we see um, it says there's a need to ensure that the problems relating to the audit trail for SNIE investigations, demonstrating that the system meets the requirements of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, have been impact assessed as incidents and are considered by the acceptance and release authorization boards, if not satisfactorily resolved. In addition, it will be necessary to consider whether the current level of cash account errors will, effective, will affect the accuracy of settlement with clients when considering the rate at which the system should roll out. And from your earlier answers, do you take it that you had no involvement um, in the conclusion to that report? None whatsoever, and the names that are mentioned, none of the names um, ring a bell either. Um, would you agree that the conclusion appears to draw a link between cash account errors um, and the accuracy of the audit trail, which was used in investigations? It would appear from that that uh, there were significant problems, yes. And would you have expected that to have been communicated to I, I, you? I would have thought so. Yes, yes. And so you don't remember any follow-up work after this period in relation to those errors or concerns that were raised? No, no, none whatsoever, or any um, discussions regarding the, the suitability of the system um, as to the Police and Criminal Evidence Act or anything like that. I, 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 I really can't remember anything at all. Thank you, that document can come down. Um, 
I'd like to turn, please, then, to your involvement in the investigation of Alan McLaughlin. And to help with your memory of the case, Alan McLaughlin was the postmaster at Brookfield Post Office in Tennant Street in Belfast. And he was prosecuted for <coughs> 15 offences of false accounting, which were said to have occurred between the 13th of December 2000 and the 26th of July. Um, after initially contesting the charges, he pleaded guilty on the 16th of February 2005. He received a fine and was ordered to pay compensation. And following his conviction, he lost his business and was made bankrupt. And his convictions were quashed by the Court of Appeal in Northern Ireland in 2022. And is it correct then that you were the second officer in Mr. McLaughlin's case? Yes. So I'd like to start then with the special audit which was arranged at Mr. McLaughlin's branch. Um, you attended that audit on the 26th of July 2001 with Ms. Winter, is that correct? I, I did, yes. And you explain in your statement that the audit and subsequent interview had been arranged following irregularities having been identified in respect of pension allowance claims at the branch? Yes. And did you have any involvement in looking at those issues before you attended the audit? Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, Suzanne Winter and myself had been through all the case papers. We looked. She had collated all the information which she'd received regarding pension allowance uh, over claims, and we discussed the matter. Um, the schedule was prepared, and we decided there was sufficient evidence to go and talk to the sub postmaster. As I previously said. The sub postmaster was our first and primary source of contact. And so during the special audit, what was your role? Not, nothing, not, no, no, nothing at all. Um, the special audit, as, as previously mentioned, um, Mr. McLaughlin was told the special audit had been recalled because of irregularities in a cash account, and we were required to speak to him after the audit was complete. And he just asked to um, watch the audit take place, uh, mentioned that he would have the right of a uh, legal representation and or a friend, um, and he chose to have his mother present as friend, which, although strictly wasn't part of it, but in the, in the interest of fairness, we said that was not a problem with, with the interview. <coughs> and then the audit progressed. So, um, during the audit, did you cons conduct any searches of Mr. McLaughlin's branch? No, no. So, could we please have um, AMCL 000032 on the screen, play, please, at page 177? It's quite a big document, so I'll just take a moment. And so this is an excerpt from um, Mr. McLaughlin's interview, which we'll come back to in, in more detail in a minute. But it's right, isn't it, that you were one of the interviewing officers along with Miss Winter? Yes, yep. <coughs> and if we look about halfway down the page, page 177, so we see the initials FT. Do we take it that that's you speaking? And... You say, now we also recovered from the dustbin this morning the, to try and assist the auditors. There's actually a listing that somebody had prepared. I'm now showing you a listing which has been stuck together with sellotape because it had been destroyed. So did you carry out searches um, of the branch at any point? I suppose that constitutes a search. We didn't actually go through drawers and cupboards and the like. Um, but obviously we noticed something in the dustbin which was recovered rather than sort of um, searching the property as such, yeah. And would, have, would that, to your recollection, was that been inside the branch or was it out, outside the branch? That, that I, I can't remember, but I'm, I'm assuming it would have been under the counter uh, in the branch in the secure area of the post office. Um, so... So it's your evidence, is it, that you didn't actually formally search the branch, but you did search the bin inside the branch? Well, we didn't formally search the premises, um, but, we, but I suppose from that it would appear we searched the dustbins. I can't remember actually doing it. Um, 
In fact, when I think about it, I think it actually wasn't myself or Miss Winter who found it. Um, I believe it was one of the orders who actually found it. I can't remember which one, but I think they mentioned it in their statement that they actually found that in the bin and brought it to our attention. So what you said in that little excerpt of the interview, you said, we also recovered from the dustbin this morning the, to try and assist the auditors. Do you agree that it sounds like it wasn't one of the auditors, it was either you or Miss Winter who recovered that? Well, perhaps we did recover. I, I honestly can't remember, you know, sort of 23 years ago. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, difficult. Um, so that can come down for a moment. We'll go back to it. Thank you very much. Um, so is it correct then that the interview was conducted later the same day as the special audit? It was conducted the same day, yes, at Mr McLaughlin's premises. <coughs> And in your statement, you say that having read the tape transcripts of the interview, um, Mr. McLaughlin briefly mentioned Horizon, but did not suggest or have concerns about the re reliability of the Horizon system, which could, could have contributed to the accounting irregularities identified. Does that remain your understanding of the interview? Yes, yeah, he, he did mention Horizon, and he said initially it had a few problems with it. Um, but then when we started talking to him regarding the pension allowance overclaims, he didn't actually say, oh, it's Horizon's problem. He, he didn't say that. So I think if we could go back then to that interview transcript, um, it's AMCL 000032, starting at page 94 of the document. <clears throat> So we can see that, um, as you said, Miss Winter and you were the interviewing officers and Mr McLaughlin was interviewed and his mother, Margaret McLaughlin, was present. Yep. And I'd like to take you then to page 152 of the transcript. And about a third of the way down that page, um, you we see your initials again, and you say your balancing is quite exceptionally good. Do you see that? Yep. Just highlighted there. Um, and you then go on to say, Ian, which I think must be Alan, um, must be all credit to you, to the systems, in the way you're operating. Um, but when I look through them, going back to the beginning of the, of the financial year, you go on to say there's ups and downs because there's nothing. I don't usually want to go above 50 points. Um, and then towards the bottom of that page, you say, but things that have been declared and you know. And then if we look over to the neck, top of the next page, say 13 pounds surplus, nine pounds surplus, 25 pounds short. And you then go on to say it's exceptionally good, except this. Um, so were you then looking through Mr. McLaughlin's accounts at this point and commenting that in general they were they were of good quality, except for this issue with the pension and allowance claims? Is that your reading of that transcript? Yeah, Do you yes. agree with that? Yeah. Going then, please, to page 154. At this stage of the interview, Miss Winter was putting to Mr McLaughlin apparent discrepancies relating to pension payments shown by two documents. And that was the computer ad list and the weekly summary sheet, which I think you've referred to earlier in your evidence. Yes, yes, yes. So we can... But a third of the way down, we can see you're referring to the summary and also the actual ad lists. Um, is your understanding that those are two automated documents produced by the Horizon system, the ad list and the weekly summary? The, the ad listing can be produced by the uh, um, Horizon system, yes. The idea being that as you transact a document, it goes into the memory of the system, and then at the end of the week, you produce a... Or you can produce a snapshot at any time and print off the, the, the list of 
vouchers that should be contained within the bundle. Yes, yeah. And is the same of the, the weekly summary, that's a document produced by the, the computer system? And, and so, so, yes, so what would happen is the, if, if, if the pension allowance would run off on a daily basis, in, which it would have been on a busy office, then they would be collated. So at the end of the week, just a gross figure will be shown in the, in the cash account for pension allowances paid. Yeah. At the bottom then of page 154, please. And we see Miss Winter says, and what made it interesting was that you always seemed to be balancing. And then Mr. McLaughlin further down says, yeah, it would start, we got dreadful problems balancing because of the problems with the capture system and the change over to horizon. Things were very seesaw, very up and down, you know. And he then at the bottom of the page says, it wasn't stable at all. So do you understand that to be him raising issues with the Horizon system when his branch first moved over? Well, yeah, the capture was the earlier system and it transferred to Horizon. Um, but that was one of the few limited um, mentions that he had of the, did of the Horizon system. And if we go over to the top of the next page then... You then ask, when did you go onto Horizon? Um, he says, in September of 99, and it wasn't stable. The balance were not stable at all. In your statement, you've described that you think Mr McLaughlin was one of the first branches to move onto Horizon. Is that correct? Sorry? So you, you, in your statement, you said that you thought Mr McLaughlin was one of the first branches to move. Yes, it was rolled, I believe it was rolled out sometime in July 1999, so Mr McLaughlin would have been in one of the first offices, yeah. And then just a little bit further down, you say, you say um, but that's two years ago, and then you say, yeah, well, you could control by now, by not, now, not then. Um, so was what you were saying there that that seemed to be a problem two years ago, but didn't explain the problem now? Was that your view? Yes, yeah. So, going on then to page 166, please. And if we see beside um, the tape counter time 2918, Miss Winter says it should, it doesn't explain how for last night, for instance, there's three amounts were then put through the system. Mr McLaughlin says, again, it's personal time, trying to get the balance on, trying to get it, you know, done by a certain time in a way. Because when I was first here, you know, and they were all over the place, we were 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. Um, yeah. So do you agree that at that point he's talking about having further problems um, getting his balancing correct? Well... It would appear so, but whether that was a result of the Horizon system or Mr. McLaughlin's um, operating system, I, I don't know. But uh, yes, it would appear that it was a system or some problems. Do you agree that one possible explanation for the problems could have been the system? One possible explanation could be the Horizon, yeah. And then at page 169, please. Um, so this second comment from you on that page is, right, OK, so you've had some big shortages. You become, um, Mr McLaughlin, three lines down, says, agrees with you, and he says, big, big shortages, yep. And you go on to say, and, and for that reason, with a little bit of manipulation here to inaudible, the surpluses to make good the shortages... So was your view at that point was that the only explanation for the shortages was that Mr McLaughlin had been manipulating the figures? Well, the, what Mr McLaughlin was doing wouldn't have created shortages, it would have created surpluses. Um, so what he seems to be saying here is that he was having some shortages with the Horizon system and, well, that, that's one explanation, the Horizon system. Um, and he was taking it upon himself 
to correct those shortages by manipulating the, um, the, the pension allowance payments that your, your office was making. On this, he does say he was having shortages, but at one point during the um, interview, he also said he had a member of staff who was dishonest and she was uh, dismissed. Shortly after, his balancing did improve. So that was another explanation, not, not always the horizon system. And he then goes on to say at the bottom of that page there um, on the screen, you think, oh, fine, that's balancing and all the rest of it, but stores up, a bit stupid, really, it stores up problems and you know it's not accurate accounting. Do you agree that there he is suggesting that um, it's the system that isn't accurately accounting rather than him? I, I took that to be that his accounting wasn't accurate um, because of what he was doing, manipulating the cash on hand figures and overstating the pension allowances that have been paid, not necessarily attributable to the Horizon system. Would you agree that it's not necessarily clear, though, on that account there that he's talking about his own accurate accounting? It could be that he's talking about the computer system. OK, it's not 100% clear, but that, that would have been my understanding at the, at the time. And if we could go on then to page 181, please. So we see a question from you, um, which is, uh, which was the figure we just carried in your cash account? So why did you adjust it by £660? The answer, obviously to make the cash account show a reasonable balance. If that was the amount over, that must have been the adjustment. So at that stage, um, Mr McLaughlin accepts adjusting the figures. But that's to make the accounts balance. Is that your understanding? That, that's what he, he, he suggested that he was doing. He was making the accounts balance so they looked acceptable. Um, and that was one uh, occasion where he made the, adjusted the, by £660, yeah. And then going to page 196, please. <clears throat> so at the, the second line of that page, we see that the um, allegation of false accounting is put to Mr McLaughlin. Um, so that, that is a false account, which is for you to submit this to the post office. Answer, hmm, you say, is actually a criminal offence. Mr McLaughlin says, sorry. And you say, no, no, it's in... As, uh, this pattern, as you've said, has been going on regularly since perhaps January, February of the current year when Mr McLaughlin says, yeah, in, when I found out that, you know, what a procedure, inaudible in brackets, um, what the postmasters were actually doing wasn't, because obviously we've had size, um, wildly variation ca um, cash accounts for a period but whenever I found out that what they would do would be they would take the money, hold it, put it in, or keep it aside as according to what indication they were getting of where the cash account was going. I mean, that that is what, in my unclear way, it's always been, well, this is the practice that everyone's doing, so it must be what you do to establish a continuum of inaudible, acceptable accounts. So, in summary, did you understand that what Mr McLaughlin was saying was that there were other people with variations in their account and this was how he understood other people were trying to accurately balance their accounts? That, that's, that's, that's what he's saying, whether it's based on fact or um, wishful thinking, I, I, I don't know. Was that something that, taking it at face value, um, you would have wanted to look at further if, in fact, other people were having the same problems as him? Well, there, there were no specific allegations. They're just other sub-postmasters. 
Um, it, it could have been supposed most in Northern Ireland or nationally or whatever. At one point, Mr. McLaughlin employed on a part-time basis the former sub-postmaster. So whether they had been talking um, and the other sub-postmaster from his experience was saying, everybody's doing it, get, get on with it. I, I, I don't know um, where that came from, but certainly from, from our experience, you know, it's not a wild, uh, not a widely um, operated system of, of, of fiddling the, the, the cash account to make it look good. And do you mean, in your experience, that isn't what other sub-postmasters or mistresses were doing? It's possible. It's difficult to generalise. Um, but ultimately, if, if sub-postmasters are doing that, the likelihood is they're going to be caught out when the office is audited. If they're doing what Mr McLaughlin was doing by inflating the value of paid pension allowances, then... I, I think sub-postmasters realised that the sheer volume of pension allowance of vouchers collated or collected every week, there was no way anybody could actually, or any organisation, could physically count every one. So I think there was a belief that it's a bit, you know, if you try it on like that, then you may get away with it. You may not. So my question wasn't so much were other people also inflating the figures, but whether you were concerned that other people seem to be saying they were having um, wild variations in their accounts. Would that have been something that would concern you as an investigator? That, that would concern me. What, what, what is the, the problem is that if they were doing the same as Mr McLaughlin, they were disguising the fact so nobody actually would know unless they said to the retail network manager, I'm having problems, that there was a problem in the office. By falsifying the cash on hand, or inflating the paid pension allowances to make an acceptable balance. It's not showing a true account, but it's also not highlighting the problem that there is an issue in, in the office with the balancing or with the horizon system. But would you agree that as an investigator, you would have had the obligation to look to see whether there were actually problems with the balancing and the figures in the branch? Well, as I say, we, we, we did actually look at the cash accounts for the office, but because they, they were being manipulated, it was difficult to actually identify when or when the errors occurred or what the value of the errors were because of what Mr McLaughlin was doing. Um, Thank you. If we can move then on to page 202. And um, the second line down, Miss Winter says, uh, and you were aware that this was a criminal offence because it was falsifying accounts. Mr McLaughlin says, I wasn't that, I never thought about that or put it in those terms at all. No, I wasn't as aware of that. I wasn't aware of that. And Miss Winter says, you were aware that it was wrong to do that. And he says, I was aware that um, what, what I thought was, if not unaccepted, but a common practice to keep reasonable accounts. And next question from Miss Winter is, so you were, you were aware that you were falsifying your accounts? Mr McLaughlin says, not, I wouldn't have set out to do that in that form or with that intention or plan. Um, but as it were, that by allowing this kind of pattern to go on, the final accounting probably was not would not be completely accurate. Um, so do you accept that Mr McLaughlin is denying um, criminality? He's saying that it wasn't the case that at the start he was <clears throat> intending to inflate his figures, he was doing it to balance his accounts? Yeah, I accept on the points to prove for this, he's not accepting dishonesty. Um, but what he was doing was still wrong. And so, obviously, others had to decide um, whether there was a criminal intent in what he was doing. 
did you, in terms of points to prove, did you ever consider or um, give any thought to whether there was an actual loss at this branch? There was an actual loss which was shown in the, um, well, there was a, a loss because of the value of the pension allowances overclaimed, which was around about £10,000, I believe, um, without checking the schedules. So there was a loss to the post office in that respect. And um, was the evidence of that loss on the weekly summary and the ad lists that we talked about? It was, it was a combination of all of the ad lists which, he had, been, which had been submitted and which had been checked either by Lisa Halley or by uh, Ms Winter um, after the Lisa Halley had reported a, a number of discrepancies in the office. And I think you accepted earlier that those two lists, that those two documents, the ad list and the weekly summary, were documents produced by the Horizon system? Yes, 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 they were, yeah. So did you ever give any thought to the fact that those could, there could be errors in the system that were generating a loss which wasn't actually there? Well, they weren't generating losses. They were generating... Surpluses. Or a discrepancy, beg your pardon. So, so I, I know the Horizon system sort of going onwards has shown that a lot of offices were finding lots of losses. But what Mr McLaughlin was doing, or what was coming through on the Horizon printouts from his office, was, would have generated a surplus, not a shortage. So in any event, it was a discrepancy in his it would, it would be a discrepancy, but uh, in his favour. But would, did you ever consider that that was caused by an error in the system rather than Mr McLaughlin? Well... No, because we're dealing with physical documents. This is going back in the day, now it's all electronic, but back in the day when you tore a foil out of the pension book, kept that in the office as your record and paid the client however much it was due. So there should be a voucher in each ad list to support the figure in the ad list. If there was a voucher missing, then um, where was it, basically? And if it was happening once or twice, maybe error. But the ad list itself was a computer-generated document? Is well, the ad list would be computer-generated, but controlled by the operator. Okay. And so is it still the case, then, that you think that potential errors with the system were only mentioned briefly by Mr McLaughlin? Or do you accept that he did, on numerous occasions, report potential problems? He, 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 he mentions them in passing. He doesn't mention... The difficulty is substantiating what he's saying by comparing it with the respective cash accounts because he was manipulating the figures in the cash account. If he'd been showing true accounts, then it would have given more scope for an investigation to be carried out. But because he was changing the figures, it was more difficult to actually go back and find out what he'd been what the real state of the account was. But do you agree that it still was your role as the investigator with Miss Winter to get to the bottom of, of that as best you could? We got to the bottom as best we could, I think, in, in, under the circumstances. Um, and plus Mr McLaughlin's admission that he manipulated the cash, account, the cash on hand and he also um, adjusted the pension allowances to make the account look good. So, moving on then, after the interview, you explain in your statement that it would have been normal procedure for you to liaise with Miss Winter um, regarding the preparation of the case, but do you have any recollection of actually doing that in, in Mr McLaughlin's case? I would have spoken to Miss Winter um, regarding that, I've obviously given her a statement because I was involved in the interview. Um, but what direct involvement I had after the interview, I wouldn't like to say. Um, maybe it was quite limited because the length of time it took for the case to be presented to the PSNI um, and for them to process it, um, most of the work would have got bit fallen on Miss Winter's shoulders. And um, just to be clear, when you say you wouldn't like to say what your involvement was, is that because you can't, you don't have a specific recollection I, of it? I, I, I don't have a recollection of exactly what my involvement was, other than 
the in interview. Can you remember requesting that Miss Winter pursue any lines of inquiry following the interview? No, I don't think I, I, I don't think I did. No, I'm sure I didn't. So you mentioned that the PSNI hadn't progressed this case prior to your leaving the post office in January 2003. Do we take it from that that at some point prior to that you must have submitted the case to the PSNI? I, I can't remember when the case was submitted to the PSNI. Um, it would be fairly timely, I would suggest, but I can't say that it was you know, the end of 2001, the beginning of 2002, I, I, I can't remember. So um, can you remember what stage the case was left whenever you left the post office in January I, I, 2003? I, I, can't, I, 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 can't, I can't be certain. I would suggest it would be well progressed if not ready for, for submission to the PSNI, but I, I, I can't be certain. And moving on then, please, from um, that transcript can come down, thank you, um, to your involvement in the case of Maureen McKelvey. And again, before, to before help... Before you do that, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, before you do that, let me just get um, Mr... Thorpe. Thorpe's uh, view about um, the likelihood of where the case was when he left. This interview under caution was July 2001, and you left in early 2003. I mean, from your, even if you can't remember this specific case, from your dealings with cases in Northern Ireland, would you think it likely that um, you hadn't submitted the case to the PSNI over a period of 18 months? I, I feel certain, sir, that the... Um the case would have been submitted to the PSNI uh, before I left, but as I say, I, I, I can't actually categorically say, yes, it was within six months or with six weeks. I, I, I can't remember. Well, well in, in, in relation to English cases, you said that it was quite common for them to be processed quickly. Um, my impression from what you've been saying earlier was that um, that you, from your perspective, namely the post office, you would reasonably quickly decide whether or not to present a case to the PSNI, and the delays occurred thereafter. Now you seem to be suggesting that it could have taken many months for the post office to decide whether or not to present a case to the PSNI. Uh, I'd just like to get a, a flavour of all this, if I could. No, I, I, I believe, sir, that the, um, the delays were once the case was submitted to the PSNI uh, rather than within the post office. Once the case was completed, interviews completed, witness statements, all evidence gathered, uh, the case would then have been presented to the PSNI for them to progress it. So, as I say, I can't put a time scale on it, but it will be reasonably quickly. All right, thank you. Yeah, sorry, Ms. Miller. Oh, thank you very much, sir. So, moving on then, please, to your involvement in the case of um, Maureen McKelvey. So, Mrs. McKelvey was the postmistress at Cl Clannabogan Post Office in Oma, and she was prosecuted for the theft of £4,623.48 and pence which was alleged to have occurred between the 13th, um, which was, beg your pardon, she was prosecuted for the theft of, um, in the region of 4.6 thousand pounds. And she was tried and found not guilty on the 16th of September, 2004. But nonetheless, she lost her business and was made bankrupt. Is it correct that, similarly to the case of Mr McLaughlin, you were the second officer in this case and Miss Winter was the lead investigator again? Yes. And also, similarly to Mr McLaughlin's case, a special audit had been arranged following a number of irregularities in the pension and allowance claims. Exactly, yep. And again, you attended the audit um, on the 4th of April 2002 with Miss Winter and members of the audit team. 
And later that day, is it right that you and Miss Winter interviewed Mrs McKelvey? We did in the presence of her solicitor, yes. Could we have the interview transcript on screen, please? It's PNI 000001 <coughs> underscore 062. And it's page 50 of that document. Thank you. So we can see the date of the interview. You're present with Miss Winter and um, Mrs McKelvey, and then Stephen Atherton was her solicitor, is that correct? Yes. Going then to page 54 of that document, please. And if we look then um, to Miss Winter's question, which is how do you go about preparing everything for your cash account? And Mrs McKelvey says on the Wednesday, Miss Winter says yes. And Miss, Mrs McKelvey then gives an account. I'm not going to read all of it, but starting at the end of line five, she says... <coughs> You tried to audit and do everything, you know, put everything out to go through it at different stages on the computer and bring it all to balance. That doesn't always balance first time, as we all know. But some weeks, if I'm out, the next week it usually balances itself out, you know. It's neither big amounts here or there. I know it will balance itself out and I'm happy, happy enough with that because I'm the one who's doing it. And I know if it's a mistake made, I know I've made it, and just a simple mistake, and it will all sort itself out the following week. But that's the way I do, to the best of my ability, and I don't do anything wrong as far as I can see. Do you agree, then, that Mrs McKelvey was explaining that she had trouble balancing her accounts, but in her experience it usually worked itself out? Yeah, yes, yeah. I think what she's also referring to is that the fact that she's running, um, because it's a rural office, she's bending the rules a little bit and allowing people to come in at all times. And she has this Camp Hill community, which she runs a um, a post office account for out with the outside of the post office. And I, I think what she's saying is there that she can have um, errors occurring with the Camp Hill Community Office and with people coming in at odd times of the day. Um, but it's likely that if she made a mistake this week, <coughs> it could correct itself next week when she brings everything to account that she's transacted late on the Wednesday, yeah. And going please then to page 76 of this document. And if we go, sorry. Thank you very much. So if we just look towards the bottom of the screen, um, Miss Winter says, just before the completion of the interview, I just want to confirm a conversation that I had with Mrs. McKelvey this morning, where Mrs. McKelvey, you produced a bundle of 12 paid pension and allowance foils with an ad list paper clipped around them. And the date on the ad list was the 4th of May, 2001, timed 1752. And it was cash account period seven. And you had stated to me that you found the bundle of foils last week in an envelope under the counter in the post office. Is that correct? And she says yes. And then if we could go to about two thirds of the way down the page. Just a bit further down. And you at the bottom of the screen we say we see you say 
we can have with us, paper rustling in brackets, the foils to be checked to date. Would you like to examine those foils again? That's with the tape recorder off whilst you do that. If you would like to examine them in any way, Mrs McKelvey says no. Going down the page then, please. And you say to see if there's anything on there that you can suggest there's been a problem. And she says, are these foils wrong? You're saying these ones from, Miss Winter says, from this schedule. And Mrs McKelvey says, no, that's okay. They're okay. And just skipping to the bottom line, she says, um, if it's there, it's there. Like, I can't. You're saying it's on paper. That's it. Um, so do you understand that Mrs McKelvey is accepting that she wouldn't find fault with the hard copy documents that in terms of the, the foils themselves? Sorry, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. So you've, you've presented the foils to her and you've asked her, do you want to check these to see if you can find a problem with them? And she seems to be saying, no, those are all fine. The foils themselves are fine. I'm not going to find any issue with them. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, that um, she doesn't feel there's anything wrong with it. The foils on that particular bundle, yeah. And Miss Winter at the bottom of that page then asks, have you anything else you'd like to say, Mrs McKelvey, before we conclude the interview? If we look over the page, Mrs McKelvey says, yes, I do believe I did everything to the best of my ability. I've been doing it for 11 years and I've done it right. If there's been an error on the computer, uh, question mark, I've just done that. I didn't mean to do it. That's all I can say. Um, do you agree then that she raised that there might be an error with the computer at that point? Well, it, it's sort of speculative, isn't it? You know, if there's been an error on the computer. I know earlier in the interview, she did say that she liked the new computer system and she felt proud of herself but with the way she was coping with it. But at this point, that you said speculative, but she did raise it in her answer to Miss Winter at that point as a potential issue. <coughs> well, she's suggesting there could have been error on the computer, but only a suggestion, really. And we can see then in the que the next um, questions from yourself and Miss Winter that there were no follow up questions um, in relation to there being a potential error on the computer. Is there a reason why neither of you proved that suggestion that there was an error on the computer? <coughs> Sorry, I'm not sure what we're looking at. So, so we're just looking at Mrs. McKelvey had made the suggestion that if there's been an error on the computer, she says with a question mark after it, would that have been something you would have thought I should ask about that further to understand what she means by that? Or do you think you should? But perhaps, perhaps yes, it should have been um, explored f slightly further on that particular instance, yeah. And this interview um, was taking place less than a year after you interviewed Mr. McLaughlin. And did you appreciate that there were any similarities between those two cases, Mr. McLaughlin's and Mrs. McKelvey's case? Not, not really. Um, that transcript. Pen, pension allowance manipulation uh, was quite a common um, inquiry that we had to deal with, and the the surplus. <coughs> oh, excuse me. The surpluses generated could have been to satisfy losses on the horizon system, but often some postmasters um, would use the means of financing their private business and this sort of thing. I'm not suggesting in either case that was the issue here, um, but there was no real suggestion that the horizon was any way at fault in this, because again, if horizon was generating these errors, then it would have been surpluses in the account rather than shortages in the account. Do you accept, though, that even if it was a surplus, that would have still been an error? It wouldn't have oh, affected yeah. a true account? So it, there, it still would have been an error. So there still could have been a system problem? 
And in both of these cases, both postmaster and postmistress had described problems balancing, in both cases, in relation to pensions and allowances, and also mentioned the possibility of there being computer errors. Did you draw any link between the two cases at the time? At the time, no, no. And the, you told us that Mr McLaughlin's case hadn't been progressed by the time that you left uh, the post office. So at the time of Mrs McKelvey's interview, the investigation into Mr McLaughlin's case would have still been ongoing? Yes, yes. <clears throat> And similarly to Mr. McLaughlin's case, did you liaise with Miss Winter about this case following the interview? Liaise with Miss Winter regarding the um, the investigation in Mrs. McKelvey's case. I, I would have liaised with her, yes. Um, and as, uh, we did feel in Mrs. McKelvey's case that. There was possible confusion because of the way she was manipulating, not manipulating, the way she was operating the downhill community because there was large sums of money involved in, in that because you're paying pension allowance out and things like that. That was a possible source of the, um, to generate losses, but then it didn't account for the fact that there was systematic um, of pension allowances being claimed systematically, which hadn't been paid, which had been sh shown as being paid, but hadn't been, no documents were there to su support the, the payment. So, so um, is it the case then that you considered that part of it might be down to Mrs. McKelvey's error, innocent error, but then it left things unexplained that you considered were um, merited a criminal prosecution? In hindsight, it possibly is, as we talked about earlier on, a borderline case where the sub-postmaster could be referred back to the regional network manager for them to say, we think it's an error, therefore we're going to deal with it in a disciplinary matter, disciplinary form. However, the, the strength of the evidence shown on the schedules which Miss Winter prepared showed that this was happening week after week after week after week, which suggested it wasn't uh, error, it was more deliberate action. Uh, and we never got to the bottom of why it was occurring. Uh, so firstly, do you accept that you could, she could, if uncorrected, just been making the same error again and again, not realising that she was making an error? She, she could have been but the amounts varied week on week. And if it was the same error, as I say, they should be shown in the cash account as surpluses, which wasn't the case. And did you request that any reasonable lines of inquiry were pursued by Miss Winter? We, did, we didn't follow anything further than the evidence we already had. Because you said that you didn't get to the, you felt like you didn't get to the bottom of it. As, as to <clears throat> what was causing the overclaims, if it was error, and it didn't appear to be error, it appeared to be more um, di direct action rather than error. And from what we had and the evidence we had, it, it, it didn't warrant further inquiry. And so is it right that you, this case was still in progress when you left the post office? Yes, yes. And do you remember at what stage this case was at whenever you left the post office in 2003? Well, well again, um, I would imagine it was already complete and ready for submission, if not already being submitted to the PSNI. But I can't remember at what stage it was, was at when I left. And when you retired in 2003, who was it that became responsible for managing investigations in Northern Ireland? It was uh, a gentleman called Dave Pardo. He took over from me. And was there any kind of handover process between the two of you where you explained, these are my cases, here's the case of Mr McLaughlin and Mrs McKelvey? 
Well, at the time of the handover, I had no active cases, so I spoke to Mr. Pardo and in, obviously introduced the team and explained how we worked. Um, so it wasn't a, an in-depth handover because each of the investigators would be able to sort of talk him through what they did, how they did it, what the reporting procedure was and the like. Because Mr. Pardo would come from England where obviously the reporting system was different. So when you say though when you, that you retired, you had no live cases, Mr. McLaughlin and Mrs. McKelvey's cases were still live at the point where you left? So, sorry, yeah, 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 I, yeah, it's the same mistake I made in my witness statement. Yeah, the, the, I was active in, in so much as I made a witness statement in both the McKelvey and the uh, McLaughlin cases. But unless I was called, I, uh, I wouldn't have had any more input into the case than, than that. In terms of then handing over to Mr. Pardo, do you remember ex talking him through either case and saying, this needs to be done, this is where we are with it? Or would that I, I, can't, I can't remember doing that, no. So lastly then, with the benefit of hindsight, do you have any reflections in respect of the way in which criminal investigations were conducted specifically in Northern Ireland? I, I don't think so. It's, I, I think the, the cases were investigated um, to the best of our ability and to the best of our knowledge regarding the Horizon system. At that time, things have progressed since then, so obviously as things have progressed, things would have changed in the way investigations are carried out. But on these particular investigations, it was early days within the rollout of Horizon, we were operating three systems, the Horizon, the pen and paper system, and the branch offices had a different system again. So it was um, learnings we went along in that respect, but I, I, I believe we did what was necessary and the <laughs> outcomes were what, we'd, what we would have expected, really. Thank you very much for your assistance, Mr. Thorpe. I don't have any further questions for you. Okay. Um, sir, do you have any questions before I check whether there are any from core participants? No, thank you, no. Mr. Jacobs, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thorpe. I act for Maureen McKelvey. I have a few questions for you. Um, you were taken by Ms. Miller um, to Mrs. McKelvey's interview. Um, and uh, in which she said to the best of her ability she's been doing her job for uh, 11 years and there may be an error on the computer and you acknowledge that that, that should have been explored further is that right? Sorry that uh... um, in your evidence just now you acknowledged that Mrs McKelvey's raising the computer system at her interview should have been explored further she only mentioned it very briefly earlier on she said how satisfied she was with the system and how she was then, she felt she was coping with operating the system. Um, I think she said, at my age, which I disregarded saying. But um, I, I don't think there's much more we could have done to interrogate the system. I'm just referring you to the answer that you gave at quarter past 12 today. You said that you, that you now think this should have been explored further. Had we had the means to do that, yes, yes. You left in um, January 2003, that's right? That's right, yeah. Um, your name is on the investigation report? Yes. Um, did you see that report? I, I think I did, but I can't remember it. It's not in, it's not in the bundle and I can't remember. Right, perhaps we can have that then. on screen then. Um, it is um, PLL. Zero zero uh, seven zeros underscore zero eight two. And Miss Winter was taken to this on Friday. I don't know if you followed that hearing.
So if we go to page four of the PDF, please. And scrolling down to the bottom, please, of that page. I think we can see there um, your name is Les Thorpe. Yes. And you're the investigating team, the investigation team leader, and the yep. report is submitted in December 2002, so that's a month before you left, is that right? Uh, yes, yes. So now if we can go to page seven of uh, the PDF. And if we scroll down, please, to the last line there. So what we can see here is um, McKelvey could or would not offer a reason for the discrepancies and stated she had done everything to the best of her ability. Um, do you accept that in your investigation report with Ms. Winter, you didn't raise the fact with PSNI that Ms. McKelvey had said that she'd had problems balancing and she'd raised the possibility of computer errors? I feel sure that would have been discussed between Suzanne Winter and the PSNI I certainly wasn't privy to any um, discussions regarding that. Um, perhaps in hindsight, it was an issue which could have been raised and could have been recorded in writing. Um, but I, I think it was a, a, a minor issue regarding what, what had actually gone on in the office. Well, um, isn't this something that should have gone into the investigation report to assist PNSI to decide what to do with the case. Yes, I accept the point, yep. You also said at 10 to 11 this morning in your evidence that you never requested information from Fujitsu and you don't believe anybody in the Scottish team or the Northern Ireland team requested information, certainly while you were there, is that right? From, from Fujitsu? Mm. Yeah, no, no, we never did. If a sub-postmaster or sub-postmistress had raised an issue with the computer system, why didn't you think it was appropriate to investigate that with Fujitsu, given that you had a duty to undertake reasonable lines of inquiry? Well, in the, in the two cases we've looked at, we were dealing with physical documents, not, not computer-generated information, as, as is the case now where everything is on the computer, then we're dealing with physical documents which were missing. Um, and it didn't seem to be an issue with the computer system because if it was an issue with the computer system, that would have been reflected in the, the balance recorded by the office on a weekly basis. Okay. And that wasn't the case in either McKelvey or um, McLaughlin cases. If we could move on then, going to the next page in the investigation report. What is said third, uh, on the last page, if you could scroll down, please. The, dis the third paragraph from the bottom there. The discrepancies summarised on the pension schedule indicate it is due to deliberate action and not error and McKelvey is the only person with the appropriate access and opportunity. Now, do you remember that an issue came up in the interview when, um, for week 32, which was in October 2001, um, the work had been done with a red pen in a different way to how Mrs McKelvey would normally have done it? Mrs McKelvey did say during the interview she was the sole operator of the post office, with the exception of when her daughter came back from university, I believe, the daughter would occasionally help in the post office. But um, I, can't, I can't remember the particular... Maybe we could then just very quickly go to um, that interview transcript. If we could go to um, uh, PNI 70 is underscore um, 082. And the 
sorry, um, I've got that wrong. It's 062, underscore 062, and it's at page 86 of 304 in the PDFs. So we should be to, if we could get up to 12.46, please. If we could scroll down. I think it's two pages on from there. 197. So we've got um, Ms. Winter saying, um, I'm showing you copies of updated pension schedules dated the 21st of May from Clannabogan. She goes on to say, my interest, why anybody had covered for you, if we go to the final page of the summary, it's just summarizing the discrepancies that I discovered when checking the weeks right through from week 26 to week 53, and what I said on week 32, just halfway down the page, I've indicated it was prepared differently to other weeks compared to the way week 32 was the week ending the 31st of October 2001. Um, Mrs. McCovey says, I wouldn't have been on leave, I don't think. She's not sure. And Mrs. Winter says, it just seems strange. And Ms. McCurvey says, prepared differently from other weeks, red tick on the list. There's a conversation about whether it was Halloween at the bottom there. And then if we scroll um, over um, to um, two pages down at 1717. And we can see she says, would that have been the week we had the errors that I got Gary, Gary out? Um, and um, then um, she says, yes, there was a week. I remember I said 500, it was short or over. Ms. Winter says, that particular week, week 32, your office was showing 104 pounds of a loss in your cash account. And Ms. M Mrs. McCovey says, that seems like Gary or someone else had checked all the bundles or something. There was a week so hard to remember. Um, so what we have here is we have a suggestion um, that one of the transactions that was later um, said to have amounted to uh, an act of theft um, could have been undertaken by Gary Grogan, who was the area manager. Do you recall that? Well, Take that off the screen. Re reading, that, reading that, it, obviously, Mr. McKelvey had had a, a problem balance thing and she had contacted the retail network manager for advice and assistance. He had come to the office and he had gone through everything for that week's cash account, hence the red ticks. Um, quite what he, what he found, I think it was £101 surplus in the, uh, shortage in the account. Did you consider that you should have contacted Mr. Grugan to say in week 32, did you do the balance at a time when Mrs. McCurvey wasn't present at the branch? I, I don't think that said he, he'd actually prepared the balance. Well, hadn't, hadn't she, had Mrs. McCurvey had a problem with the balance and contacted the retail network manager for assistance to try and find the source of the loss? Um, but we would have spoken with Mr. Grogan there's no evidence that Mr. Grogan was ever contacted and asked, were you present without the sub-postmistress in week 32 and did you undertake this balance? There's no evidence of that at all. Okay, well, I, I, I feel certain, I can't remember doing it personally, but I feel certain that a conversation would have taken place with Mr. Grogan, uh, whether it was evidenced in writing as you're saying, it isn't. So um, I can't be sure what except exactly you, went on. Do you accept that this is the point that potentially points away from the guilt of Mrs. McKelvey and should have been investigated? I, 
I wouldn't like to accept that it points away from Mrs. McKelvey. It just shows that she was asking for additional help or she wanted somebody else to prepare a balance, um, which is £101 short. Had Mrs. McKelvey prepared that balance, would the pension allowances have been manipulated to cover that £101? You're aware that Mrs. McKelvey was acquitted by a jury after you left, of course. She, she was, yes, I saw it was a majority verdict, yeah. This is a point that should have been raised in the investigation report, isn't it? This point about I, Mr. Okay, Rugen. I, 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 I accept that it, it's another factor which should have been recorded, but um, at the time it probably didn't seem overly relevant. That's all I can assume. Isn't that really something for PSNI to decide, not for you? Yes, yes, it would have been, yeah. I haven't got any further questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. There's no further questions in the room. All right. Oh, no, okay. sorry, beg your pardon, Miss Page. Sorry. Right. Mr Thorpe, it's about the uh, document that you were shown, which you hadn't seen at the time, and you've only seen much more recently, which names you. Yes. <clears throat> um, just to remind you, after going through the figures that, uh, that you had apparently found out about what it was going to cost to reinstall the fraud management system, it says this. Um, these concerns were highlighted after a possible fraud at Grange Park SPSO. Can you remember what happened at Grange Park? I, I, I have no recollection at all of the, that, that document or any, anything that's within it. I, I, the, the actual name of Grange Park doesn't ring a bell. A lot of sub post offices you think, oh yeah, that's Leeds or that's Glasgow or whatever. That doesn't ring a bell at all and I can't remember at all being involved in any uh, research to find out the cost of getting information no, from right. computer systems. So um, no recollection of Grange Park, no recollection of, of these concerns at all. But you accept, didn't you, that these were serious concerns? The, the way it's been worded there, yes, obviously there were concerns at that time. Can you help us with who would have been responsible for trying to get to the bottom of these concerns and what needed to happen as a result? Well, I, I didn't recognise any of the names on the report, so I can only imagine it would have been controlled by the um, security investigation team nationally rather than just localised, possibly picking on local outlets to... Um, to sort of create case studies. So is that Tony Marsh at this time? Uh, at, at that time, it wouldn't have been. I would think it possibly would have been Phil Gerrish. Uh, Tony Marsh, I think, took over after Phil Gerrish, but uh, over time, I can't remember it, exactly when people were moved in and out of All post. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Those are my only questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Apologies, that was my oversight. Uh, those are all the questions in the room. Well, thank you, Mr Thorpe, for uh, coming to give evidence to the inquiry and making a statement in advance. Uh, I'm grateful to you. Um, uh, so that concludes today's business, was it, Ms Miller? It does, sir, and we're back again tomorrow for the evidence of Kevin Shales at 10. All right. So we'll adjourn until then. Thank you. Thank you.